Okay, we are live. Right. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, welcome to Derek Presbyterian's Issues class. Uh, my name is Pete File, and I'm currently the chairman of the Mission and Peace Committee. Uh, if you'll join me in a word of prayer. Mr. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and our time together. I ask for your continued presence and guidance and direction for all those who are helping refugees to relocate and gain a better quality of life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last uh, July, <clears throat> members from Derry and All Saints Episcopal Church met together to form a welcome team and under the directions of Church World Service we agreed to help a refugee family relocate in the Hershey area. Today, we're happy to have Alex Swan, who is the Insight Director of Church World Service in Harrisburg. So Alex, welcome to Derry. All right, thank you so much, Pete. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, as Pete said, my name is Alex Swan. I'm the Site Director for Church World Service Harrisburg. Um, I was here about this time last year. Uh, I guess not physically here, but I presented online at the time. Um, and at that time, we were just opening up our brand new office in the Harrisburg area. Um, and so it was just all about essentially what our plans were for opening that office. But Pete invited me back today to kind of give an update one year later of where things stand. Uh, so I'm excited to be here today and to be able to present on all the really important things that have been happening over the last year. Uh, but before we begin, I just wanted to say thank you to Derry Presbyterian Church. Um, you have been such a great supporter since day one, uh, both with financial contributions to our organization, as well as, as Pete alluded to, forming a welcome team to walk alongside one of our Syrian families uh, coming up on one year. So we just really appreciate all the support and continuing to work together in this really critical work. Um, so because this presentation is more focused on one year later and sort of the developments that have happened since we opened our new office, I'm going to kind of skim through some of these slides because when I gave my first presentation I talked more about this type of stuff. So I believe the, the video of last year is still online on YouTube. Uh, we just checked the number of views, actually it's right around 100. Uh, so if you want to kind of go back and check out that video, it'll provide some really good context. But just as a friendly reminder, uh, Church World Service is a global organization. They have a presence in over 30 countries around the world. Uh, and I thought it would be helpful to still just highlight the vision and mission because that's really what we're focused on. So the vision of Church World Service is a world where everyone has food, voice, and a safe place to call home. And the mission is that CWS is a faith-based organization transforming communities around the globe through just and sustainable responses to hunger, poverty, displacement, and disaster. Uh, because CWS has that global presence, they're doing a lot of really important work around the world, but primarily within the United States, the focus is on that displacement piece with refugee resettlement, as well as other services to uh, different types of immigrants. Uh, you might have heard of our crop hunger walks, so we do also locally help out with the hunger part of uh, Church World Service, both by raising money for hunger relief locally in our local communities, as well as raising resources uh, and money for hunger relief around the world. Uh, just some history about CWS. So it was born in the aftermath of World War II. At the time, obviously, there was a lot to respond to, and so there were a number of denomination and churches kind of doing their own things individually. They thought at the time that it would make a lot more sense if they came together and formed one organization, which became Church World Service and share resources and expertise and personnel to respond to the crises more effectively. Uh, so those are the, the roots of how Church World Service became what it is today. Over time, particularly uh, after 1980 when the Refugee Resettlement Act passed in the United States, um, CWS did become one of the nine refugee resettlement agencies. Uh, there are now 10. Uh, there's been an additional one added since then, but for a while it was nine national refugee resettlement agencies that have offices throughout the United States welcoming and supporting our new refugee neighbors. Um, and then particular to CWS Harrisburg, we work with partners to give hope, opportunity, and relief to refugees and immigrants uh, and to promote a diverse and welcoming community. Uh, this is a short video. Um, 
I'm hoping that the people online should be able to hear it if I play this. Yeah, so, they will. All right, let's give this a whirl, see what happens. Um, for some reason, the actual link isn't coming up. Let me, for the sake of time, I'll skip over this, and if we have some extra time again, I'll revisit this, but I don't want to spend my entire morning trying to play this video. <laughs> but it, it just uh, provides like a three-minute synopsis of sort of highlighting the work that we've been doing the last year in partnership with our parent office, CWS Lancaster. Um, so again, gonna kind of skim through some of this because I touched a lot on this at the first presentation, but again, some good context to keep in mind. Um, there are an estimated 100 million displaced peoples world worldwide right now, including an estimated 27 million refugees. We'll get into the actual definition of a refugee but to put that into perspective, about 1 in 78 people on Earth right now are displaced, and again, 27 of those 100 million qualify for refugee status. So it's clearly a big crisis. Uh, we've all been following the news, and it, unfortunately it doesn't seem like it's going to be slowing down anytime soon with the war in Ukraine. Of course, we had the fall of Kabul and the Afghanistan evacuation in the summer of 2021. So. There's been a lot of turmoil in the world, uh, and so I think it just highlights the importance of the work that we have been doing and continuing to do with our community partners to respond to those crises. Uh, so of course, when we think of refugees, I think a lot of us think of just our shared humanity first and foremost, our responsibility to welcome the stranger and walk alongside other people that for no reason of their own were forced to flee for their, for their safety. And I think that's really foundational to the work that Church World Service does, keeping that at the forefront, that we have that common humanity and we want to walk alongside our brothers and sisters. Uh, but there is a, a legal definition to refugees, which of course is important um, as well. So I just wanted to highlight that as a reminder. Uh, refugees are people who flee their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution based on the reasons listed there, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular group and who are unable or unwilling to go home. Uh, this was defined in the 1951 UN Convention on Refugees, so the definition has been there for quite a long time. Um, and as we think about a lot of the programs and services that we offer as Church World Service, many of them are for refugees in particular, so folks who come to our office either directly resettled by us or come through other agencies and find their way to our doors. Many of them have to meet either the definition, the legal definition of a refugee, or another legal definition of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which include asylees, humanitarian parolees, unaccompanied minors, a whole host of particular eligibility categories. But the one that we primarily serve are refugees. Um, so as the, the definition alluded to, you know, refugees have to flee their country for um, a particular reason and then usually find themselves in a neighboring country in a refugee camp. Once they're in a refugee camp, um, there's a variety of things that happen. Of course, the most basic one is just responding to uh, the essential services of having somewhere to live, having food, having clothing, having water, these types of things. Um, but then they go through the process of legally becoming a refugee, so that includes backgrounds, clearances checks, security checks, medical appointments, cultural orientation. Um, they have to provide documentation to justify why they are uh, unable to return to their home country. A whole host of things that are processed over a period of time. Um, and then if they are finally deemed refugees, then they have to get authorization to travel to a third country if they would like to do that. Um, including here in the United States. So a lot of people think of refugee resettlement that a lot of them are coming to third countries, including the United, Sp United States, but it's actually quite a small number. Only about 1% of the refugee population actually end up in third countries. A lot of them just stay in neighboring countries surrounding the, their home country that they had to flee in the first place. So I think that's really interesting as well. Um, so. I briefly mentioned the Refugee Resettlement Act of 1980. Before that, there was refugee resettlement happening in the United States, but it was primarily through private sponsorships. Uh, many of you may be aware of how the United States responded to uh, the Vietnam War and the Vietnamese refugees that came, including in this area, in the Fort Indian Town Gap area. 
Um, so that was all kind of primarily taking place before 1980, but with the passage of the 1980 Refugee Resettlement Act, it sort of solidified and formalized the ways that refugees are processed and enter the United States. Um, so it worked in partnership with the federal government and agencies like ourselves to um, welcome and support refugees. So when the act first passed, if you see the blue line, that's the annual ceiling that is set by the president each year. That's the annual ceiling. Uh, so at the beginning, it was over 200,000 refugees were allowed to be admitted to the United States. Um, and then you can kind of see how it dropped very significantly, kind of ebbed and flowed uh, post 9-11, kind of dropped and stabilized uh, under the previous administration that hit some historical lows. And then you see that blue line under the current administration kind of come back up again. Um, the more important line though is the orange line, that's the number of actual admitted refugees. So it's one thing to say that we're gonna welcome this amount of people, but it's another to actually welcome them in the United States. Um, for a variety of reasons, usually the orange line lags a little bit, uh, but particularly after 9-11, as well as during COVID for you know reasons you probably suspect, uh, there was a lot of pauses in refugee resettlement um, and a lot of infrastructure was taken away under the previous administration as well. So it's still taking some time to kind of build up that infrastructure, get back to an more normal processing post COVID, those types of things. So. We're optimistic and we are starting to see that this chart is a little outdated, but for example, this year we're, this fiscal year, we're probably gonna hit about 60,000 welcomed refugees, uh, which is a big number compared to the past several years. And then I'll talk about the future of our agency, which also includes next federal fiscal year. Their target number is 145,000 total, which is quite a jump. Um, and that'll include 125,000 refugees as well as 20,000 special immigrant visas or SIVs. So we're entering a really exciting historical time of re refugee resettlement. And I'll talk more about kind of how our office is preparing for that. Question. Yes. Hey, the, the ceiling, uh, I, I'm not used to anything on a governmental uh, level changing that radically uh, year to year. I, I, I'm, so I'm, this is not Congress doing this. What is, so is this strictly a, a administration choice? Correct, strictly okay. administration choice. And obviously, you know, before the previous administration, of course there were some ebbs and flows in the ceiling, but overall refugee resettlement really was a bipartisan effort. It was pretty much supported universally. Um, that changed very significantly under the previous administration. And so it'll be interesting to see if refugee resettlement moving forward kind of reflects the polarization of our country if we start seeing dramatic up and down, which yeah. makes it very difficult as refugee resettlement agencies because we rely heavily on funding from the government. So the moment the government takes away our funding, we have to lay off a lot of staff. And then if another administration comes up and wants to do refugee resettlement again, then we're trying to hire as quickly as possible. So it is really interesting and we'll kind of see what the, the next few years hold. Um, but yeah, it's a great point, especially reflected in the chart, how it has changed over the years. Um, so specific to our local office in Harrisburg, we officially opened in February of 2022 and we're considered a sub office to CWS Lancaster. Lancaster has had an office since the 1980s. Uh, so they've had a presence there for a long time. And, and in fact, a really interesting um, piece of information is that Lancaster County resettles more refugees per capita than any other county in the United States. Um, so it's really neat to have that experience so close to here, as well as all the technical assistance and resources that our parent office in Lancaster has provided to us. If you haven't been to our office yet, we're located on Front Street right next to the Governor's Mansion. Beautiful building. I know Pete was there not too long ago. Um, we have ceiling to to, to floor windows overlooking the river. So anytime you're in town, feel free to stop by. Uh, we would love to have you there. Um, some data in terms of our actual arrivals specific to our office. So when we first opened, it was kind of coming off the tail end of the Afghan evacuation. Um, and so at that time, our primary focus in February, March, and April of 2022 was responding to that crisis. The government stood up a completely separate program called the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program. 
and refugee resettlement was paused completely with the exception of responding to the situation in Afghanistan. So our focus was the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program, and in total we ended up welcoming 34 Afghan new neighbors. Um, and then sort of moving into April and, and um, May of 2022, the Afghan program really slowed down a lot because most of them were resettled at that time. So we turned our focus to the traditional refugee resettlement program, which is the reception and placement program. This is how historically since 1980 refugees have come to the country through this program. We ended up welcoming from February of 2022 to September of last year, uh, a total of 90 refugees from various countries around the world. That's not, that's not 90 families, that's total individuals. Sometimes people ask for that clarification, so just wanted to include that. Um, and then to date for the current fiscal year that we're in now, which started October 1 of 2022 and will go until September 30th of 2023, we have thus far welcomed 85 refugees from various countries. Our stated capacity for this year is 110. Right now we're at 85, so we're kind of coming towards the tail end of our capacity, but still we'll be welcoming some additional families over the summer months. Um, and finally, just kind of wanted to highlight these last two numbers. Also in uh, 2022, the Ukrainian program started uh, to respond to the situation in Ukraine. Unlike how traditionally refugee resettlement happens through the RMP program, the Ukrainian program is a private sponsorship program. So groups such as yourselves have the ability to go through a government website, fill out an application, and then privately sponsor a Ukrainian family. So they would come directly to you. You would be responsible for you know, trying to find housing, uh, helping them with school enrollment, getting them enrolled in public benefits, all the types of stuff that, that we do in partnership with you. Um, and then our role as a resettlement agency, instead of actively resettling these folks, we're just going out in the community, finding Ukrainians essentially with their sponsors and just letting them know that if we can be of any assistance, we're here and available. Um, and primarily focusing just on the, the gaps in services. So if a, if a sponsor doesn't really have a good understanding of how to enroll in public benefits, they could tap into our staff to help with that. If they need help identifying housing for Ukrainians, we could help with those types of things. So we're not providing all the services, but we're working in partnership with the sponsors to help our Ukrainian new neighbors get settled and then ultimately become self-sufficient. Um, so this is a, a timeline of sort of some of the big events that have happened since we opened our office in February of 2022. As I alluded to, when we first opened our office, we were focused on the Afghan program. So on February 5th of 2022 is when we had our first Afghan family arrive through our office. At the time, it was still just me. <laughs> so I was serving as a, a case manager as well as a director trying to build an office and hire staff. It was a very chaotic time, but I appreciate looking back on that experience because I got some firsthand experience of working directly in the field with some of our new neighbors. Um, March 14th is kind of our official opening of our office. That's when we finally actually got the keys to our physical office location. <laughs> um, and so we, we deem March 14th as the official launch of our office. Shortly after that, we had a really neat event at Midtown Cinema in, in Harrisburg. Uh, where we showed an Afghan film and just brought the community get together to celebrate the opening of our new office. Uh, April 20th was when we had our first non-Afghan family come to our office. It was a family of four from Iraq, and that started the RMP program officially in our, in our office, which I'll get more into the exact populations that we've welcomed thus far, but the, the very first non-Afghan family that we welcomed was a, a family of four from Iraq. On May 4th, we had a great family fun day at Lake Tobias, <laughs> uh, brought together a lot of our Afghan neighbors, volunteers, staff, and just celebrated uh, together at Lake Tobias, which was a lot of fun. Uh, August 30th was when we had our first Ukrainian client enrolled in one of our programs. Uh, the Ukrainian program, which I alluded to, that private sponsorship program, it's called PC GAPS. PC stands for Preferred Communities. I'll save that for later in the presentation, but the, 
The reason it's called gaps is again because our role as a resettlement agency is just filling in the gaps of services that are not being provided by the sponsor. Um, we had our first, our first non-federal government grant so, uh, from a local foundation approved on September 16th of 2022, and that's when our program CWS Marketplace launched, which I'll also talk more about shortly. Um, and then of course, September 30th was the end of our first fiscal year in business. Uh, in total, we, including the RMP program as well as the AFCAM program, from February until September of our first year, we ended up welcoming 133 total new refugee neighbors. Um, and then the next slide kind of finishes out some of the big stuff that happened in our first year. Like our day at Lake Tobias in the fall, we decided to do something similar at Mount Airy Orchards. Um, I believe the, the Heichel family, the family that was supported was at that event. Uh, just another family fun day to bring everyone together and, and celebrate. Uh, we had our first annual fundraiser on November 26th, which was called International Friendsgiving. Um, essentially the idea behind International Friendsgiving was we knew that a lot of our new neighbors were bringing really cool cultures, traditions, as well as food uh, to our new communities and we wanted to tap into that because food is a great equalizer, right? <laughs> so we um, we reached out to some of our, Af our, it wasn't just Afghan neighbors, all of our neighbors to see what types of recipes they'd be willing to share from their home countries. We decided on five of them representing five different countries. Uh, and then we, with the permission of the, the clients, gave those recipes to a caterer who sort of mass produced them, packaged them in individual dinner boxes. We sold them for $20 a box um, and had like a, a drive through at a local mosque in, in Harrisburg and were able to raise um, just over $20,000 between the meals that were sold as well as some of the sponsorships from different community partners. So it was a it was an amazing event. We got a lot of positive feedback. So we're in the planning stage of this year, uh, which I have a, a save the date slide at the very end uh, for International Friendsgiving in November. Um, in December, we opened sort of a, a satellite office in Carlisle because a number of our Afghan neighbors were being resettled in Carlisle because uh, a lot of them already had family and friends from other agencies that found themselves in that community. So we wanted to be able to provide more direct service to our new neighbors that were living in Carlisle. So we partnered with the Employment Skills Center on Main Street Carlisle and they donated a, an office space within their organization to allow some of our staff to work more directly in Carlisle. So super excited about that partnership. We still have staff that spend some time in Carlisle providing those services, and we're hoping that this will be the starting the start of a more formal um, presence in the Carlisle community because it seems like they're really positioning themselves to be a long-term host community to refugees for the years to come. So I, I think this is a really exciting opportunity for us to have a more direct presence in that community. Um, December 10th, we had a, an amazing Congolese Christmas party. One of the biggest populations that we welcomed was folks from the DRC. Uh, by, by December 10th of last year, we probably had uh, close to 50 new neighbors from the DRC. So we wanted to bring them together in community and just celebrate them. So we partnered with a local church in Harrisburg and had a, a Congolese Christmas party, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then lastly, you know, February 5th was kind of our one year anniversary because that's when we received our first families uh, in 2022. So we had another celebration at the West Shore Three Theater in New Cumberland, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and then these five bullet points kind of speak to some of the stuff that's gonna be happening moving forward. Um, so number one, we're hiring a lot of new staff, um, primarily because, like I said, next f federal fiscal year, the Biden-Harris administration is set in stone on welcoming a historical number of refugees. So obviously we need to start building the infrastructure to do that. Um, so just recently we brought on two supervisors. Um, so there's myself as the site director, two different supervisors. One oversees the resettlement side of our operation, which is that first RMP 90 days of case management, housing, essential services, school enrollment, employment, all of those critical things that happen within the first three months of resettlement. Um, and then on the other side of our house is our integration department, which focuses on 
post 90 day resettlement, some of the longer term programs that we have, which I'll speak to more here in a second. Um, so within those two departments, we're hiring a bunch of staff, um, including right now, we're looking for two, two more employment specialists, um, as well as a part-time housing and transportation spe specialist. Uh, so just always wanted to put that plug in in case you or anyone you know might be interested in this type of work. We are actively hiring for those positions. Um, I mentioned Carlisle and how that community really seems like it's, it's getting serious about long-term refugee resettlement. Uh, so we wanted to be a part of that. So we started looking into some funding opportunities in the Carlisle community and through the Partnerships for Better Health, which is a local foundation there, they recently awarded us a grant called Ubuntu. Ubuntu is all about um, prioritizing well-being and mental health for our refugee neighbors, which is um, a really common challenge that we see across the board with many of our clients. Um, just through their, their lived experiences, they, they bring a lot of baggage uh, with them and, and the difficulties they face adjusting to starting their lives in the United States. It's, it's not easy for anyone and it can very easily lead to some challenges with mental health and well-being. So this funding will allow us to um, provide two different programs around mental health and well-being that are culturally appropriate to our new neighbors as well as spoken in different languages. One of them is going to be listening circles where we're just gonna bring folks of similar backgrounds and, and countries and languages spoken together with professional counselors who also speak their language and just kind of talk and, and just see organically if anything comes out of that about what they would think would be helpful for helping them with their mental health and, and well-being challenges that they face. And then the other program is trauma-informed yoga. Uh, so there's also a lot of research that suggests if you get people together and, and do certain body movements as well as just provide relaxing atmospheres that can help a lot with community integration and overcoming some of these challenges. So those are the two sort of programs that are being funded by the Ubuntu grant. And this is all laying the foundation for recently announced big federal grants around mental health and well-being for refugees. So this is kind of a pilot program, see how some of these programs might assist in that area. And then we're optimistic that this will you know, provide an argument for when we pursue big federal grants to be able to bring on additional staff, as well as potentially like certified counselors to help some of our clients, as well as our staff to help process mental health and, and well-being. Um, CWS Marketplace, I'll talk more a little bit later. I think I have another slide about that. Um, we just recently put in a grant application for an employ employer engagement grant through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Essentially, this would allow us to hire some staff to spend their time out in the field making connections with employers who have expressed interest in hiring refugees and immigrants. Uh, for example, locally here, Hershey Company it could be a potential employer that we'd want to try to engage with. And just hear from them what would be helpful from us as an agency to be able to provide and work in partnership with them to really think about not just entry level jobs for our new neighbors, which of course is important, um, but how do they really establish themselves in their community and grow in a company that they, they start working for. Um, so that's the employer engagement side, which is a, another really exciting program that hopefully we'll be able to get funding for. Uh, and then lastly, just generally speaking, I've kind of hinted towards this, but at least for the the next year, while the current administration is still in place, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens election year um, next year. But right now, I mean, they're all in on refugee resettlement. Again, going to try to hit that 145,000 number. So um, it's going to take agencies building up capacity, but they're also um, releasing new programs such as the Welcome Corps. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Welcome Corps yet. But Welcome Corps is another option for folks who want to get involved with refugee resettlement where it's exclusively private sponsorship. So you'd be working completely independent from a resettlement agency, but you would be responsible for very similar services that we provide. So you'd be required to raise some money, find housing, all the other things that we do, but just as private sponsors. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really neat developments happening uh, around the country, including here locally as we really lay the foundation for what's going to be a, a very exciting but uh, probably some points overwhelming year of resettling that many people. But <laughs> um, these are just some 
some pictures I wanted to share of just some fun memories in this past year as an office. This is our first Afghan family that we welcomed in February of 2022 from Afghanistan. Um, shortly after, I think it was actually that following weekend, uh, Samir and Tamana, who are also Afghan, um, they were supposed to get married uh, right before the fall of Kabul, so they never actually had their wedding in Afghanistan. So once they got settled in, in Carlisle, uh, they wanted to still have a celebration and have their wedding. So they put together a wedding at a local park and they invited us to be a part of their big day. It was just a really neat moment. Um, our office you know, also tries to have some fun when we can because uh, I think that's really important for everyone. So this was a staff appreciation day that we did at Gifford Pincho State Park. And then that's our International Friendsgiving. Um, I don't know if any of you have met our resettlement supervisor, Dari Sharif, but that's her and I serving up some coffee. Uh, that was locally donated from elementary coffee. So just some, some pictures and some fun memories from our first year as an office. These are the specific numbers of folks that we welcomed and from the countries that they came from. So, you know, I've mentioned several times at this point that obviously we welcomed a large number of Afghans, uh, 22 through the RMP program, as well as 34 through the uh, Afghan program. So. In total, we actually had about 50 folks from Afghanistan. This pie chart just reflects our RMP program. Um, so that's about 50 actually from Afghanistan. I mentioned our big population from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is still by far the biggest that we've served. Uh, right now we've welcomed 68 new neighbors from the DRC, as well as Guatemala and then Syria, which of course Derry Presbyterian Church has walked alongside us in helping to welcome and support a family from Syria. Um, and then some other countries as well that we've welcomed. So I mentioned a lot of these programs kind of throughout the presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna go through this information just very quickly, but just kind of wanted to highlight the programs that we are offering. Um, so of course we have the reception and placement program. This is the traditional refugee resettlement program. A family comes to the Harrisburg Airport, we walk alongside welcome teams, pick them up from the airport, take them to housing. Uh, right now housing is definitely the biggest challenge that we face. I mean there's a housing crisis in general, let alone working with people who don't have a credit history, who don't have a job right away. You really just have to find landlords who want to support our mission uh, and want to rent to newcomers. So it's a big challenge. Um, so I also also like to highlight that because I just never know when someone might know someone who has a property or a landlord or a real estate agent, but we are always looking for folks who are willing to rent to our new neighbors. Um, in addition to the airport pickup and housing, we also require food, clothing, um, help them get enrolled in ESL classes, cultural orientation classes. They're required to go through medical appointments, uh, school enrollment, social security cards, employment services, all those core things that have to happen to restart your life in another country. Uh, so that's our 90 day resettlement program, reception and placement program. Um, this is our PC GAPS program, which I uh, mentioned is our Ukrainian program. Similar services, but we're, we're not the ones actually actively resettling Ukrainians. Again, they're being privately sponsored. We're just going in the community and helping where we can, filling in those gaps of services. Um, this picture was from our International Friendsgiving. Um, those are some of our Ukrainian new neighbors that made some of their uh, famous apple cake, uh, which is really delicious. Um, and so it was really cool. Not only were we able to provide a platform to celebrate culture and, and different foods, but also we were able to involve some of our new neighbors for that event. And they, spent several hours in the kitchen helping us make a ton of Ukrainian apple cake. Um, our matching grant program is one of our employment-based programs. Um, so within the first 30 days of arrival, we do a matching grant assessment to determine if the family that is being welcomed could benefit from um, extended employment-related services. Most of them are. The only exceptions is people who are unable or unwilling to work. Obviously, they're not gonna be a good fit for a, the matching grant program because it's focused on employment. Or those folks who are uncertain if they're gonna be living in 
their initial community for up to eight months because the matching grant program is eight months long. But besides those two, so long as the family is willing and able to work and want to live in the area for at least eight months, then we usually enroll them in our matching grant program. Once that happens, they are paired with an employment specialist who walks alongside them to help them find um, employment. And the reason it's called matching grant is because for each client enrolled in the program, our agency is required to raise $1,000 worth of match. It doesn't have to be just strictly financial donations. It, it can also be in-kind donation. And in fact, most of our match is volunteer hours. We have a certain formula that we use to get an estimated value of volunteer hours. Our volunteers report the hours. So Pete, thank you for helping us with that. <laughs> uh, and then we're able to report the number of volunteer hours and count that as match. Uh, it's a really great program, um, you know, because of a new office, we obviously, it, it took some time for us to hire staff. We had some staff turnover at the beginning. So I think matching grant locally um, is entering an exciting time because up until now, we've always just had one employment specialist, but very soon we'll actually have three full-time employment specialists. So really optimistic that this program can really get serious about um, finding employment for our new neighbors. Then we have our Preferred Communities Intensive Case Management Program. So the matching grant program is focused on the entire family, helping them reach self-sufficiency within eight months. The Preferred Communities Intensive Case Management Program is focused just on individuals and helping them overcome barriers to self-sufficiency. And this program is really meant for the most vulnerable people that we welcome. So these are the vulnerability categories that they have to fit in order to be eligible for the program. So they could be a minor, a young adult without parents, single parents, elderly, LGBTQ+, social or psychological trauma, HIV and AIDS, survivors of torture, domestic or sexual gender-based violence, substance misusers, disabled and ill, or social isolation. If they fit one of these categories and we do an evaluation and determine that they could really benefit from extended services, we can enroll them in our intensive case management program. When that happens, they are paired with one of our intensive case managers who walks alongside that individual for a minimum of six months, but actually can go all the way up to two years if that sort of care is needed. Um, and they sit down with them, develop a self-sufficiency plan to think through goals and objectives that they have, and then help them accomplish those goals and objectives over a long period of time. So it's a really important program um, that we have in our office. Unfortunately, right now we're completely maxed out. Our, our capacity was 20 folks and we're at 20. But as people hit their graduation periods, which is usually around a year once they're in the program for one year, we do another evaluation to see if they still need these services. Um, we might have some additional openings becoming available soon, uh, but just a really great program that I think is doing some really important work. Um, the CWS Marketplace program, I alluded to the, the first grant was for this program. Um, so the CWS Marketplace program is specific to our local office. There's no other office in the country that has this program because it's funded locally by some different foundations. Um, and the rationale behind this program is we noticed early on that a lot of our new neighbors, particularly our women new neighbors, brought just some incredible skills and abilities in terms of making things, including arts and crafts, as well as food. and we thought it'd be a really cool opportunity to support them in those endeavors. Um, so we sort of piloted it last year at um, Arts Fest in Harrisburg. We just asked some of our new neighbors if they would be willing to make some things and if they needed certain items or resources, we provided those to them. We got a bunch of really cool like scarves, necklaces, um, packaged food, all these cool things, put them on a display table in Arts Fest and not only did it draw more people in to learn more about the work that we do, but it also just provided an outlet to highlight some of their amazing work, as well as all the money that was raised went right back to the artisan. So it was a really successful sort of pilot at Arts Fest, and we then thought it'd be really important for us to find some funding to support it. So we were able to secure some funding recently from some different foundations, and actually are to the point where we now have a dedicated staff member on our team who, when new neighbors come, 
they do an assessment to determine if they do have any like creative abilities. And then if they're interested in being enrolled in our program, if they are, then they walk alongside them to provide the resources that they need. They provide some uh, digital literacy classes, English classes, entrepreneurship classes, just to help them think through essentially starting a small business. Um, and again, all the money that's raised through that program goes directly back to our artisans. The cap is uh, $600, so we, we don't have to, to deal with filing taxes and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a very small program, but it provides an outlet for them to make a little bit of money, but probably more importantly, just engage in the community and kind of be empowered through making their, their arts and crafts. Um, so a really cool program that we're also really excited about locally in our office. <clears throat> um, I have a get involved slide. I mean, I, I'm going to breeze through this one because, as I mentioned at the beginning, Dairy has already done so much for us, and we're so appreciative of all the support that Dairy Presbyterian Church has provided. Um, but just, you know, as we move forward, especially as we prepare for what's going to be um, a big lift <laughs> next federal fiscal year, uh, we are always looking for financial and in-kind donations. Um, we have had a number of extremely medically vulnerable clients come to our office the past few months. Um, and unfortunately, the amount of money that we get to support them is very minimal. Um, and so the next thing to tap into to support them is often private donations. Um, so financial donations are incredibly appreciated and, and really help our office a lot, as well as in-kind donations. Uh, I know we also partnered with Dairy. You had stored a bunch of uh, furniture, which we collected the one day, and were able to get out to some of our new neighbors. So furniture, bed sheets, uh, pillows, well, I was gonna say clothing. We recently stopped saying yes to clothing because we were just getting way too much clothing. And we, we partner with a local clothing bank in Harrisburg anyway. So if you have clothing, we can connect you with them. Uh, but any other, you know, item that um, we can get donated instead of spending some of our limited money on is always greatly appreciated. Uh, of course, just general advocacy and outreach to inform folks that refugee resettlement is happening in their local communities and uh, advocating for folks to, to get behind those efforts and help welcome and support our new neighbors, including through welcome teams and then individual volunteer opportunities as well. Uh, we're always looking for interpreters, we're looking for people who can help us with our social media, who can help drive folks to different appointments, the grocery stores, all these types of things. Um, so many ways to, to get involved and if you're interested, uh, our website is listed there, cwsharrisburg.org, as well as I can provide my contact information and, and we can have those conversations. Lastly, um, we're coming up on, on 10, and I want to leave some time for some Q&A, but just wanted to highlight two upcoming events that we have. One, which we're really excited about and is coming very soon, is our first annual World Refugee Day block party. Um, so the United Nations has deemed a day uh, to celebrate refugees. It's called World Refugee Day. Um, and so we wanted to do something in celebration of that in June when it takes place. Uh, so we decided to take advantage of the large parking lot that we have at our office building and host a block party. Uh, so it's going to be on Saturday, June 24th from 12 to 3 p.m. at our office location in our parking lot. And we're going to have some really cool, fun events. Everything is completely free. We're going to have a goat petting zoo, face painting, henna painting, a DJ, photo booth, balloon artist. Uh, I think Dury also recently got a hold of a giant inflatable slide. So it... It is rain or shine, hopefully it'll be shine, but regardless, it's a, it's a free, fun day just to celebrate our community, uh, including our, our new refugee neighbors. So if you're available then, uh, again, June 24th, 12 to 3 p.m., we would love to have you. And we're also looking for sponsorships as well to help cover some of the cost of the event, um, and more information on those can be found at our website. And then lastly, I mentioned our International Friendsgiving. Um, we are gearing up for 2.0 this November. Um, we decided to move the date back one week to Saturday, November 18th, so it's not as close to Thanksgiving this year. Um, but it's gonna be a very similar event where we're gonna hopefully expand it, get some more recipes, um, be able to provide some different options from different countries around the world, sell them uh, to help raise money for our organization, 
Um, and we're also trying to engage with the community to potentially find like distribution partners. Uh, potentially one could be somewhere in Hershey where folks can pick up their, their meals closer to their home so they don't have to travel all the way to Harrisburg. So I think over the years, the, the, the International Friendsgiving event is gonna continue to get bigger and bigger and hopefully we can expand our outreach. Um, but just save the date again, Saturday, November 18th is the International Friendsgiving event. Uh, and then lastly, if you're on social media, we are active on Facebook, Instagram, as well as I mentioned our website, cwsharrisburg.org. Uh, so would love your support in those outlets. Um, and yeah, that's everything I had. So just wanted to say thank you. And I believe we have until 10.15, so love to answer any, any questions that anyone has at this time. One of the comments you made early was that Lancaster County uh, welcomes more refugees than any other county in the country? Per capita. Per capita. Correct. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. Obviously, when you compare Lancaster's numbers to some big cities, like the the sum of the amount of people they're welcoming is, is not close to some of the big cities. But if you consider the population within Lancaster County and the amount that they're resettling per capita, it is the highest out of any other county in the nation. Hmm. Do you know anything about what happens, how they are chosen to be to coming to the United States? Because I just, I'm just really curious about that. Yeah. Um, so Church World Service as a global organization is involved with pre-arrival refugee processing. So they do have a refugee processing center in Africa, specifically in Kenya, where they help process refugees to be eligible and able to come to the United States. In terms of those who are selected, um, it's essentially anyone who legally meets that definition of a refugee, and it's supported by documentation of why they're unable or unwilling to go home uh, because of fear of persecution. Um, so if they meet that le legal definition, and then if they meet all the requirements for uh, travel, which include a host of background checks, it's a very security background intensive process, they have to go through cultural orientation classes, they get some ESL classes, they also have to pass a bunch of different medical um, exams to make sure that they're healthy to come to another country, all those types of things. Uh, so, so long as they meet all of those, which takes a very long time, and we've, we've had some families that have been through that process for over 10 years, just because there's so many folks to be processed and very limited capacity to do so. Once they meet all of that kind of stuff, um, then in terms of who's selected to actually travel to the United States, the first thing they look at is, does that family already have family in the United States? So family reunification is one of the first things that they look at. Um, so, for example, we've had a number of Afghan families in Carlisle who currently still have family abroad and they want to get them to the United States. So they're going through all those processes overseas, but once they're approved, we'll probably get an email from our global headquarters saying, hey, this family was approved. We know you're already serving this family in Carlisle. We're going to send them your way so we can reunite their family. So that's the first thing they look at. And then the other thing that they look at is what countries and what communities are best positioned to welcome certain groups of refugees. So, for example, Lancaster and us have been welcoming a pretty substantial amount of folks from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so because of that, we already have community and infrastructure built to welcome that population. And so when a Congolese family is approved for travel, Again, they're going to look if they have any family first, but the second thing they'll look for in terms of where they actually end up is what, what resettlement agencies have already been working with that population so we can try to keep them together and, and build that community. Um, and the, the last thing that they potentially could look at is like if the client has a severe medical condition, they just want to ensure that the community has the infrastructure and resources to be able to serve that medically fragile individual. Um, so those are some of the factors that they look into in terms of who's actually resettled in the United States. Does that answer your question? It does, but I'm trying to match it to our family that I have a family, <laughs> which I can't. 
because to my knowledge, they have no family uh, in this area. And yeah. they, they have no personal attachments. So if that's the number one criteria, I was just curious how they got fit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously there's a ton of other resettlement agencies around the country. Um, and so sometimes we, we do get folks that they, the resettlement agencies have kind of already worked through the family ties and now we're looking at individuals who don't have any family ties and sometimes it is just kind of random luck of the draw about how they end up in our community. <laughs> That's a good point. Any, any other questions? Are they required to get a green card as part of It's an interesting question. <laughs> um, Get a card. Get a card. Oh. Yeah, so two things. Number one is our office in Harrisburg does not yet have a legal office, but we're in the works of getting accreditation to open a legal office to provide some of those services, including green card applications. But right now we work with our parent office in Lancaster who has a, a robust uh, legal office. Going back to the, the legal definition of refugees, if they meet that legal definition and they come to the United States, they're already guaranteed a path towards citizenship. Um, they just have to be in the country for five years and then they're eligible to apply for citizenship and go through that whole process. In terms of a green card, technically it's not required, but it's highly encouraged <laughs> because Getting into some law, like for example, if, if they didn't apply for a green card and they've been here over a year and someone starts to question like their work authorization status, technically they could still just say, I have refugee status so I'm eligible to work in the United States. But by getting that green card, it sort of just solidifies all of the benefits and eligibilities that they have in the United States as well as grants them a permanent residency which can help with a whole host of things so there's really no reason not to apply for it um, but I guess technically if someone either forgot about it or just didn't want to do it or didn't have the knowledge of that they had to do it they, they won't get in trouble they won't be deported or anything they'll just not have all the documentation that they they should have so. okay. <clears throat> back to the uh, selection process uh, you mentioned uh, the health care or, or severe health issues as, yep. as a criteria. But what about just living conditions? I mean, if you have refugees living in a tent city uh, in you know, Turkey versus people that are fairly well settled in some other city in some other Middle Eastern country, is there a differentiation between who you would pick? I don't think that's factored in. Um, and usually what ends up happening is there's always, unfortunately, some sort of new global crisis that takes priority. Um, you know, there's, a, there's been a civil war in the Democratic Republic of Congo for decades now, right? And there have been refugees from the DRC for a long time. But unfortunately, even though we're welcoming pretty big numbers, there's still a huge pipeline of Congolese that have been approved for a long period of time. They just haven't had that opportunity to travel yet because other global crises like the fall of Kabul and the Afghan evacuation, the war in Ukraine, keep coming up and those will always take priority. Um, but in terms of looking at the conditions of where they're living, I, I don't think that's necessarily factored in. I think it's kind of, in theory, equal across the board. They're just looking at their pipeline of folks who have been waiting the longest and then some of the other reasons that we talked about, family reunification and, and those types of things. So what length of time as a refugee is part of yeah. Okay. But it doesn't matter if you have a job in Nairobi and you're supporting your family versus, you know, walking across yeah. uh, I mean, a border. Yeah. It, it's, it's obviously also the decision of the refugee themselves. So if they have been somewhere for such a long period of time that they've established themselves and they are employed and they're becoming self-sufficient in their new country, then, you know, they could say no to being resettled elsewhere. They could say, this is just where I want to live, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not required for anyone to be relocated to the United States or any other third country. So that's your 1% issue. Exactly, okay. yeah.
so Thank much, you. Pete. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Hey, wait. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, on behalf of Gary, I'd like to present you this check for, and he said, I know you have plenty of good opportunities to use it and all that. So Thank, Thank you so you much. For, I'd like to uh, understand a little bit better how close we were to all starting this together. Yeah, that's and, right. <laughs> and continue on. So Absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, it's been a busy year. Yeah. Well, it started in there.